The following review slash critique was made possible by being given a code of the game. All opinions contained within are unaffected by this fact and are my own. Any jittery and bad movement, especially in the leftward direction, is not a game bug. This is caused by my controller. This review aims to be spoiler free, while still going over all gameplay mechanics. I may name drop, but will not visibly show any late game party members. If you would like to see more videos like this, or on Final Fantasy XIV, be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can also support me by following me on Twitch or with Patreon. Links below in the description to all of my pages and to Sea of Stars' Steam page. Sea of Stars was a very fun time, one I am glad to have played. A turn-based RPG was a style all its own. It is a game that very much wears its inspirations on its sleeve, while at the same time trying to do its own thing and stand on its own. The surface level, quick way to describe the game would be to say it's Chrono Trigger meets Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. Obviously, just looking at the footage, these inspirations are clear as day. Clean and detailed pixel art that invokes those games no problem. But it goes a level deeper with gameplay, music, and story relations. Story I'll obviously avoid as much as I can because, well, spoilers. But music, well, have you heard of Yasunori Mitsuda? Well, how about if I... Or maybe you Yeah, you get the picture. Then in the gameplay aspect, you have the timed hits of the Mario games with the combo system of Chrono Trigger, all with further unique mechanics to the turn-based system. This is a nostalgia trip for both Sabotage Studio, the developers of the game, and players alike. Aside from some specific characters, it never seems alienating to newer generations. Sure, the game very much is inspired by Chrono Trigger, but you aren't going to feel like you're missing something if you have never seen the game. For Mario and Luigi, I might even say that experiencing those games could cause you to have a harder time with Sea of Stars. I'll get into that later. What this intro is poorly trying to get across, I'm bad at intros if you couldn't tell, is why I titled this video as I have. Sea of Stars is trying to reach for the Sea of Stars itself. It doesn't merely wish to replicate, but earn itself a spot among them. A mogus joke. Unfortunately, while I greatly enjoyed my time with the game, there was a number of things that distracted me during my playthrough that make me feel like it missed the mark. They shot for the stars, but only landed on the moon. An amazing time, but fall short in a number of areas. In the course of this critique, I hope to show that this is a game very much worth playing, but not quite reaching the level of perfection I've seen others tout it as. Sea of Stars begins in media res, or in the middle of things. Yes, I'm teaching you something because not only is that what's happening, but it's a term I've heard around often enough. Anyway, we're in media res, with Zeo and Valir off on their adventure as up-and-coming Solstice Warriors. Yes, it's pronounced Valir. Want proof? Valir. And this is definitely something I gotta give the developers props for. Their content creator asset kit is really cool. And having a pronunciation guide is something more games should have. We have some names that look normal and have way out their pronunciations. Names with an umlaut that you just pronounce Bob. This removes any and all ambiguity, and any and all issues with names like Kachi. Anyway, Zale and Valir are off on their adventure to become full-fledged Solstice Warriors. We get a short tutorial section to teach us how to use basic attacks and magic. And then, we immediately flash back to their childhood. And get another tutorial. A more proper one this time. This is kinda clumsy, I find. Starting in Media Res, and then going right into a lengthy section of our heroes as kids. I think I see what they were going for here, trying to get you interested by immediately having some combat. But I feel it's too short and too uneventful for it to only lead back into the typical RPG intro. It's one of a few, but only few, spots I feel the story stumbles. Anyway, we get to see them as kids, get up to some hijinks, see why Garl is the best character, and get some foreshadowing in a few ways, along with some proper tutorializing. This is why I first really noticed how amazing the music of this game is, how the music can shift just from you entering a different room. Just listen here.
The music changes ever so slightly with entering the training room. It's subtle, but there. I wish more spots in the game had these details. There's more, but not enough, I'd say. This is likely because every area has both a day and night theme. Some of said themes are super different and magical in their own way. The music through the whole game is amazing, all the way up to the final boss. But personally, the game peaks within the first hour or two, if only because Garl's theme is my favorite theme in the entire game. The other favorite theme has got to be the first phase of the Dweller of Woe. Then there's the band that works as a bit of a sound test? That's a third version of every field theme, and a second version for the rest. That's so cool! Moving onward, we get into deeper combat mechanics. We have the timed hit system, MP system, lock system, life mana system, party swap system, combo system, ultimate system... A lot of systems. This is where my main issues all come into play and is where this video is going to focus just about its full length. A lot of this just doesn't work as intended, I feel. To preempt any accusations from people going to say I'm bad at the game and my views are invalid, here's my feet book. I'm not here to say the game is too hard or too easy or anything like that. I could go on a lengthy discussion of my feelings of that, but I would rather not. Everyone has their own experiences on what is hard or what isn't hard, and I could easily have thought this game was hard while still having that zero death count. There was no save scumming to keep the count down, no resets on battles I knew I was going to lose, I only lost a battle one time total, and it was a side quest that does not count losses as deaths. So at most, this should say one. But the game does not count it, so I can say I beat the entire game deathless. This isn't to brag, but to firmly set expectations of where my complaints come from. So let's actually talk about the combat. Let's explain the systems as we go. We have a few commands. Attack, skills, combo, and items. No run away or defend or skip. Okay. Encounters in Sea of Stars are all predetermined. There are no random encounters. At most, there's a few ambushes. This makes backtracking for items you missed for completion much easier, especially since they intentionally hide items in early areas you can only obtain in the endgame. This means you can run around the enemies and avoid encounters. However, this also means you need to try and be stealthy. If an enemy sees you, they will run toward you or otherwise try to attack and begin combat. You can avoid and get past many encounters, but others are a bit dicier. Then what happens when you do get into combat? Well, as said, endgame players have to return to early game areas for an important item for completion. Enemies don't start being scared of you like in other RPGs. They will still attack you regardless of your level. So you can very easily and accidentally end up in combat with enemies that give you basically no EXP or rewards. There is no runaway command. You absolutely must kill the enemies, no matter how fast or slow you take it. So while yes it might take only one turn to kill each enemy, that's still up to three turns you need when you factor in enemy positioning, resistances, and other factors. It's a minor nitpick, but one I did feel annoyed by. I get why there isn't a runaway, but even Chrono Trigger had that. The other issue is EXP scaling. Apparently the level cap is only level 30, which only about level 20 being where a typical playthrough will end. If level 2 needed 1000 EXP, level 3 will need 3000, then level 4 taking 7000 EXP. These aren't the real numbers, but show well how grinding is massively de-incentivized. Technically the option is there, technically you can reload an area and fight the same encounter over and over to grind, but the enemies only give you 200 EXP because they were balanced only to get you from level 1 to 2 with that 1000 EXP requirement. This feels like a lose-lose situation with how the game is built. There are people so bad at RPGs, they say strategy isn't an option in Dragon Quest XI, and that grinding is necessary. A game that definitely is made to be easy. So maybe keeping values like this to de-incentivize grinding while still making combat with while is the way to do it. Tell these players, fine, if you want to grind, it's going to suck, but maybe your problem is strategy. 
because EXP really is the only worthwhile thing from combat. Money is pitiful, and item drops are only ever cooking supplies that are usually extremely common. Only the store exclusive cooking items are ever worth their weight in combat. Oh, and all this makes the relic that increases EXP gains basically pointless. Do you even gain an extra level by the end of the game? I was level 21 and well into it. I was closer to level 22 than level 20, and I only bought the relic near the end of the game. So like, why exist? For what it's worth, I'm speaking from a design perspective. The idea that random encounters are dumb because it takes time or whatever is in itself dumb. Combat is a major factor in RPGs, being quick and snappy. It being bad because it's too common is a weird criticism. Enemy density can be too high at the extreme end, but the point is that combat wants strategy and resource investment. Defending and passing is a bit of a strategy loss. A number of times in boss fights, I would have taken a pass for the sole purpose of delaying the breaking of a lock. Lock breaks skip the enemy's turn until everyone has acted, so delaying the boss with your first action of a turn is better than with your third action. Maybe a bit of a min-max kind of thing, but it's very much something I would have appreciated for the hardest fights in the game. We're getting off track, so let's get back on. Let's talk timed hits. Mario RPG fans will be very familiar with this concept. When attacking an enemy, press the button on contact to do a follow-up hit or further damage. There was little to no deviation from this, and the exceptions all had a tutorial or tutorial mode. Specifically, I think of the bros attacks. In Chopper Bros, Mario will hammer Luigi into the ground, Luigi will springboard Mario, and then Mario can quickly spin to hit the enemy over and over. A, B, then mash A. However, there was advanced moves that you could unlock. In Advanced Chopper Bros, the button commands are A to hammer Luigi, then when Luigi goes to springboard Mario, press A again. Then instead of spamming A, you alternate B, then A, for as long as you can manage as it gets faster. In this example, you can see the color explosions around Mario and Luigi to signal now is the time to hit the button, both for the normal and advanced versions. There's also a mode where you can slow down time at the cost of making the attack cost more or do less damage, giving you time to learn the button presses in a safer environment. Sea of Stars does not have this. There is absolutely no way to know when a skill's timed hit is. You have to guess. And not every attack works the same, so their timings can have subtle variances. In a lot of cases, it isn't too hard to guess, in others, there's no reasonable way to guess without trying every possible timing that might seem to work. They even included a relic to give you a shooting star whenever you successfully hit the timed hit. But what about when I don't? How am I supposed to figure out the timing? There are a number of skills and attacks, I have no idea what the timing is still, after 100% completing the game. Valia's Moon Shield? Every ultimate attack? No clue. This relic should have had that effect instead. Have the character flash like Mario and Luigi do, so I can figure out what the hell the timing is! It also has a consistency problem with the animations. Let's take these two attacks. One is a heal, one is an actual attack. What's the timing for the button press? Notice Zale has the exact same animation between both. However, raising his sword is only the timing for the actual attack. For the heal, you need to also watch for the sparkle. At the tip of the spiral, the moment before the heal applies, hit the button. Okay, the consistent bit here is right before the effect is applied, hit the button. Now, Zale vs. Garl. What's the timing for Garl's heal? This one I only figured out because the optional quiz game told me how to do it. Did you know Garl's heal has a timing? It's right here, right before he pulls the apple out, after the second rummaging around. It turns into a half of a sandwich if you press the button. Okay then, so it differs per character then. Garl just has his presses earlier. Well, he is the exact same animation for two different Garl skills. Can you guess that the cooker attack doesn't have the same timing as the heal? The timing for this one... ...is right here when it pauses before exploding. So it's not the same between animations, not the same between skill type, 
and not even consistent within each character. It makes using timed hits a chore more than it should be. I can accept not hitting the button at the right time. I failed a bunch of times when landing timings, but I knew the timing and knew why I failed, so it felt fine because it was all my fault. But often the visual cue is so subtle, I can't figure it out. The same can also be applied to defending too. You can block attacks with timing your blocks, and sometimes it's just impossible to know the timing. And sometimes the visual cue literally doesn't exist. Look at this! Sarai is literally going off the screen while the attack's tip is to press on throw. The cue for when she throws is at the peak of the jump. When she starts to fall, you hit the button. But I literally can't do that when she's going off screen. I actually had to shift my cue from a visual cue to an audio cue. Listen closely. The portal sound anytime she goes through, notice how long the sound effect lasts before she's at the peak of the jump. That's what I used to time the button press, at least until she speeds up and I can get into a rhythm and pressing entirely on the beat. While that example is actually just plainly unfair, I think you see what I'm going for. There's a limit to how much guessing will get you, Again, there's a number of things I never figured out the timings for, and I will point out again and again. When other mechanics are extremely reliant on you knowing how to time attacks, things being so very difficult to time goes against it. Let's talk about MP. You have MP, and you spend it to use skills. The end, right? Well, I actually really like how Sea of Stars shakes things up. Your MP is low. Like, really, really low. Like, one skill is enough to bottom out your resources, and in the end game, you only have like three or four skill uses before you run out. You are stupidly pitiful when it comes to casting, but this is balanced in that basic attacks will all regain three MP for the attacking character, for both Zale and Valir for the Solstice Strike combo, along with a stack of live mana, one of the other mechanics we'll talk about later. This way you can't just spam magic when you hit a boss. You need to meet out your resources and play a bit more strategically. Find places to spend your MP smartly, and find time to regain it with normal attacks. I have no problems with this at all, though I will discuss a few side effects this has. I even really like this mechanic. I also like live mana. Every basic attack will cause one stack of live mana to drop onto the battlefield. Up to three can litter the field, and you can use this to boost any actions you take. This will add some of your magic attack stat to your damage. Using a boosted basic attack will not generate live mana though, so you can't just infinitely generate it with every action. It also adds the character's element to the first hit of your basic attack, so doing a basic attack with Zael will break a single sunlock when using a basic attack. And that's only one. Even if you get the timed hit, you won't be breaking two sunlocks. When tied into the lock system, this adds a good amount of strategy with risk versus reward. You can build up three live mana, then absorb it all to unleash one super strong attack. You risk the next turn having locks you can't break, but are rewarded with such huge damage when you invest properly. It's also just far more interesting than your attack being a basic damage attack. You gain two different resources for every use of it, on top of it doing respectable damage. It's not just the free option. Said lock system is a mixed bag. What this is, is a way to interrupt every single enemy from casting an attack. When they go to cast a skill, they will give you a turn timer to hit them with every listed skill type, the number of times they're listed, to make the skill never go off. The big issue here is... impossible locks. Impossible locks are extremely common, especially in the late game. There's an enemy that gives a shield that has like 500 HP or something stupid to an ally. It only has two locks, but it'll be, say, Poison and Sun. The only character with Sun attacks is Zael. You have one turn to break the lock, and it's the first turn of the fight. Because it's the first turn, you have no combo points to use an attack that does both Sun and Poison. Multiple enemies have the same lock, so Sarai's Disorient attack can only stop at most one of the three casts. So best case scenario, two shields still go out. There's a balance here that was definitely missed. 
because on the other end of the spectrum is the early game Romaya boss battle. The end of the fight was me essentially stun locking her because she kept trying to cast attacks that I would break in one turn. Multiple turns in a row, she did absolutely nothing to me while I regained MP and did damage to her. When stun locking an enemy like this, the turn counter for stopping their attacks seems to get lower and intentionally become impossible. That much is fine because it would neuter basically every boss if every lock was easily breakable, but there's very little leeway between impossible to break and a free break. One of the most common impossible locks I would get is Sun Moon Moon Sun Sun Moon Moon Sun lock, or simply put, four suns and four moons. Zael, as mentioned, is the only one with the sun element. He has no multi-hit attacks that do sun damage, except for the combo attack of Soonrang. This costs two combo points, and the fight hasn't even gone on long enough to get even one combo point. Nor will the fight last that long at all. So many locks seem to require you to have been playing so conservatively that you go into it with three combo points and three life mana available before the turn begins. But that's really wasteful, and probably extremely slow with how little damage you're doing by not using resources ever. I really like this system, I really like the idea of delaying or outright stopping enemy attacks like this, but far too often I felt like I was put into an impossible situation unfairly. It's super cool when you manage to break those big locks, but most big locks don't seem designed to be surpassed. At most, you can reduce the damage the attack does, but even that doesn't seem true. It never felt like the listed power was actually being applied. You either broke a lock, or took the full damage. At the very least, there's a lot of flexibility in combat and breaking locks. The ones that are possible, are possible due to being able to freely swap characters. There's multiple ways you could do it too. On any character's turn, you can freely swap them out without losing a turn. Swap to the wrong character or change your mind? Swap back for free. Then combo attacks, you're never locked out of those. Did you use Valia and Gardle already, but want to use the combo attack for Zael and Sarai? Selecting the combo attack with Zael will allow you to swap either Valir or Garl out, despite their turns already being taken. That's so cool! Sure, you don't have to plan out turns more smartly, in the sense of how easy the swapping is, but you can plan out your offensive in a ton of unique ways like that one. Make use of literally your entire party, despite only having three turns. Though the combo system, while allowing for cheesy stuff like that, is a bit underdone too. Because MP amounts are so low, they needed a specific resource for combo attacks. They would otherwise be way too OP because they wouldn't be worth spending MP on if they were weak. You start every encounter with zero combo points. To gain combo points, you just fight. Killing enemies and breaking locks will give large amounts of combo gauge. The problem is, you're capped out at three points, and most combo attacks cost two. So many battles you'll never get a chance to use them due to not getting two charges before it ends. Then using even one combo is enough to bring you back to zero points. This breeds familiarity and ruins the system. In the early game, the combo system devolved into just one choice for me, the party-wide heal. I almost never used Solstice Strike unless I could break a lock and was at high HP, which means barely ever, with me trying to end every encounter I could with a full heal. Boss fights where I could gain lots of combo points? Multiple heals. In the end game, there were several combo attacks I had absolutely never used. Not a single time. I would basically use only four of the many available combo attacks. Solstice Strike because of the MP regen and it being so cheap at one point cost, Soonrang for the issue mentioned within locks, X Strike for lock breaking, and Conflagrate because it does stupid amounts of damage. Your final party member? I used his combos twice total and the same one both times. Once to try it out, once to try and break a lock, never again. It doesn't help that the moment you get him, he has all of his combos. It undermines the part of the game where you solve some puzzles to unlock combo attacks. It's because you get him so late, but still. When your points are so few and so easy to not know how to time the hit of a combo, 
you're going to stick with the ones that you know work, unless you are so desperate to break a specific lock that you try something new. Something I basically never felt cornered into doing. Also, for some reason there are no triple character team attacks, it's only ever pairings. Then this feeds into the ultimate system. Using combo points would feed into your ultimate gauge, which will do good damage to all enemies in a fight. Your first ultimate is from Sarai and it does... alright damage, but then you get the fifth party member and see his ultimate affects party members. His ultimate does what seems to be the same damage, while also being a full heal and revive to any downed party members. So why am I going to ever use Sarai's ultimate? Zayla and Valir at least use their respective elements, which are the only attacks that do real damage to Dweller-type enemies, for as rare as those are. What did I miss? And let me ask this question again. When do you time the hit? I have successfully timed zero of the ultimates, assuming you even can. Tell me, what do I do? Tell me, Keenathan! Tell me, Keenathan! Tell me- Keenathan. Then this all leads to our final command in battle, items. I think in my entire playthrough, I used 10 items. Yeah, the limit of your inventory is how many items I used through my full playthrough. This is the consequences I mentioned earlier. When it's so easy to refill your MP, you don't need MP restoratives all that often. Then your combo points, I use constantly for the party-wide heal. The only place I really felt pushed into using items was the true final boss. I made sure to cook every item for the achievement too, but I didn't use them. I sold most of them. Cooking seems to be a decent way to earn money, which is weird with how your limit is 10 items. Obviously, if anything, this is revealing how easy or hard I felt the game was, where I basically felt the entire item system was secondary. Weaker players probably need to spend more and more items. The other part of this, though, is intended design. Save points are extremely common. Like, so common. Saves are also nearly always placed next to a campfire that fully heals you. You are never more than 30 minutes away from the next save point, and full heal. Except, like, going into a climax of the game. Oh, you're going into the Dweller of Woe fight? The thing the game has been talking about since the intro? Probably going to be a lengthy event between the fight itself and any cutscenes. This makes the game very, very easy to pick up and put down for short gaming sessions, but also it kind of destroys any long-term resource management. Like I said earlier, the big thing with RPGs having high amounts of combat isn't just because, you know, that's a main part of the gameplay and doesn't exist just to be an annoyance, it's also an obstacle to overcome, and a test of your resource management with risk and reward. With how close together save points are, this entire aspect just doesn't exist. Though this one might be entirely intentional and I can say they nailed it in that case. Like I said, I didn't even ever use items, and with how common cooking supplies are, I constantly sold them off and ended the game with several of them over 100 gathered. You're not supposed to care about resources. Do a battle, eat a sandwich, do a battle, eat a sandwich, do a battle, reach a safe point, and replenish your inventory. If that's the intention, yeah, sure, that might do it. Would also most certainly make the game easier since you will mostly make party-wide heals that also restore MP. If that's not the intention, well, sorry guys, something here seems off to me. Though again, zero deaths may say more as to why I reached this conclusion. I do at least like how this 10 item limit ties into Goral's comments early on. Pack light, only have enough for a few meals. Maybe we should have had a much more limited ingredient count? You can carry only, say, 300 ingredients total, or each has a weight. The fishing minigame makes me think this is how the game was originally built. There's absolutely zero reason to ever release a fish. It's free ingredients toward a non-existent limit. Again, I had a literally over 100 of some ingredients by endgame, so why would I toss a fish back? Because I have a limited inventory. So that couple of shrimp I got is a waste of space, when I'm looking to fill up on fish fillet. The cooking sound effects are really fun though. I bet some people will complain about the length of time it takes to cook stuff, but I genuinely enjoyed listening to the cooking ASMR. Now, something I really want to talk about is something I've seen a lot of people comment on. The fact that every character only has three skills. 
Yeah, only three skills. That's kind of very low. However, I'm not so down about this like most people might be, but I do have my own issues with this. So, three skills per character, but consider the party size. There's six party slots, one being a cargo, so just looking at the menu you can see that you will have five party members at the end. Three skills each. That means you have 15 skills plus combos, plus an ultimate, which let's be real belongs to Rashan. You do have a lot of options. So many, I didn't even use some, if just because there's too many expensive combos. You can swap party members at will to access any of these skills at any time. I can see where people are coming from though. Any 10 with Valir only has these three skills. Zael only has these options. And that doesn't really expand at all. Options for that character are indeed very limited. My issue there is how it ties into impossible locks. Multi-hit sun options boil down basically to Zael's ultimate and soon rang. So yeah, we're limited in that aspect but can use any of our team ones per turn, with no penalty for swapping. So it's like, yes, three options on a single character does feel super limiting, but any more options, and you might just end up with everyone being the same. If Zale had a Moonrang option, like Sarai outright does, they would all feel the same. Instead, Zale feels like a strong singular hit character, while Valir feels more well-rounded. If anything, the main issue is types of actions. There are no poison abilities in the game. Sure, Sarai has the poison element, but there is no poison status. No damage over time. It's an element as far as resistances go, but you can't apply poison to an enemy. You also have no other status-based skills. Valir has her moon shield that blocks a single hit, but you can't augment attack and defense stats. You know, besides live mana boosting, which has its own other things it does. There's a lot of types of actions you could take in an RPG that just don't exist in Sea of Stars. So I don't think the lack of attacks per character is the real issue. The issue is there aren't as many types of options as there should be. My favorite option is the enemy movement options. Splash damage attacks only work within a small area, so forcibly moving enemies that are out of the splash zone into the splash zone makes for extremely cool utility that is almost always worth it. Such a cool set of skills kind of proves the point. There's super cool skills you could be using, but there could be more cool types of options rather than everyone having more skills of the same options. Give Zale some kind of fiery self buff, Sarai a slow acting poison, and such. Food has no options beyond refilling your bars too. No temporary stat augments of any kind, or even options that do like Valia's shield. It's revives and filling your bars. Could make live mana bottles to toss out mid-combat or something. Pure count of options isn't the issue, it's how many types of options. That about covers my main issues. I do have other issues, but those all basically fall under spoilers, so I'll stop there. I will here reiterate that I did enjoy my time with this game. This definitely was a really good time, but I would be remiss if I did not make my criticisms known. Despite them, I will likely play this game again in the future. When, I'm not sure, but the combat is fluid and fun, especially bosses. Oh, and wheels is kinda cool, even if it is just a slot machine. Also, Keenathan. And further, remember, the game code was given for free, so hashtag ad, hashtag sponsored. Now, a message to the boy in the well. I don't know if you're ever going to see this video. If you do, you might not even sit through to see this part. But it's a message I know I must include. Some of what I have said may have come off harsh, or discouraging. The internet is a very, very harsh place. I know that much too well. Harsh enough that, no matter how amazing things may have turned out, the well may seem like a comfy reprieve from it all, that you may wish to put the gloves back on. Don't. Stand tall, stand proud. You do what so many people only dream of doing. So many people only wish they could be doing. 
you've a team of builders behind you who wish to achieve it all together. A team who are building their own town. At the center of it all? A well. As a reminder, or there to be reclaimed one day. Reclaimed to provide for everyone. Quench the thirst of all who visit this cozy little hamlet. Many do not escape from the well. They remain there. Alone, but preferring to be alone for the same fear of rejection and pain. The well is familiar, comfortable, and while it might be dark, their eyes adjust and can see just fine. Sometimes something falls in and occupies their time. They forget they are alone in the well, at least for a time. Comfy, content, and distracted. There will be another thing that falls in the well again, one day. No reason to leave to explore the world they come from. It's safer down here. But perhaps one day they might find their way out. They might find their way to this little hamlet that has been built, and hear the story of the boy in the well, only to realize they were never alone. Out there, countless wells have countless people hiding in them, afraid of the outside, settling for cold comfort and safety. But perhaps, maybe one day, they too will wander in to see what has been built, to finally find a sense of healing, to relieve their grief and sorrow, and recover their self. And then they'll thank you for showing them there was another way. For building your town of mirth. Thank you again for watching this critique of Sea of Stars. Hashtag ad, sponsored, free code, yada yada. It's clear I can't be bought that easily. This is a game that was made with so much passion and love for the genre. I mean, they went and got Mitsuda to help write music. You don't do that unless you genuinely worship the body of work he's done. The game looks great, plays great, sounds great, and despite my issues, is still genuinely great. I look forward to what further things this team can do. I'll be watching closely for the next project, and the high chance that they are being a Kickstarter. I hope you'll give Sea of Stars a shot yourself and have a great time. In the meantime, please rate, comment, subscribe, check my socials and Twitch. And remember, Everyone exists to show Garl is best boy and should be loved by all. Take care, and may the power of Anna did hogs lay waste to your enemies. Extra special thanks to all my patrons who support me over on Patreon, with the extra shout-out going out to Eamon al Khatib, Benjamin Han, Benjamin Rice, Bergie, Frazier97, Jeremy Abbott, Jericho, Kevin Lowe, Mizella, Shana, Shimmering Blaze, Supernova, T Rogue, Time, and Zero Two. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you for whatever comes next.